So, uh, so wow. Uh, hello. How are we doing? Wow. Uh, there's, there's, there's a bunch of Americans who are sitting there going, it's so hot outside, and now I'm sitting inside of this room. I really wish I was outside in the sun. Um, so my name is Luke Robert Mason, and uh, I prepared a thing. Uh, I was asked here today by Consensus to provide you with the definitive 15-minute explanation that would help you explain the blockchain at a dinner party, which, let's be honest, is the same as arming you with the exact combination of words that will ensure you'll never be invited to a dinner party ever again. Uh, politics, religion, your sordid sex life, blockchain, all up there with the top taboo topics that you should never talk about at a dinner party. Or at least that's what I thought. You see, I was very much the person who believed that blockchain was that thing you use to procure high-quality narcotics through the dark web. In fact, my only experience of the blockchain up until consensus reached out was my ex-flatmate doing exactly Exactly that. So I agreed to take up this challenge of throwing myself into your world in the hope that I could come to grips with this crazy little thing that you call Ethereum. So back in the UK, my role is that of a science communicator, uh, which is basically someone who takes abstract concepts and tries to make them as accessible to the general public as possible. In short, science communicators are professional idiots. Idiots insofar as we get to hang out with people like you, uh, who are exponentially smarter than ourselves, and then ask lots and lots of dumb questions until, uh, until something that once seemed very, very complicated becomes very, very understandable. And after having spent some time being guided through the world of blockchain, one thing is abundantly clear. Blockchain technologies, very simply, offer a fundamentally new way to do information storage and distribution. But what I see when I look at Ethereum is an attempt to take something from the fringes and to make it mainstream. But here's the crazy thing. I don't think you guys own that mission yet. After all, you have the potential to be the future for the internet. And personally, I think you're playing it too safe. The problem with explaining Ethereum to Joe and Jane public doesn't come from the fact that you guys don't have good metaphors. We've, uh, we've certainly heard plenty of them, and we're probably going to hear plenty of them throughout the course of this conference. My favorite one is that magical little piece of paper. You write on the piece of paper, and it appears on everybody else's piece of paper. These attempts at simplistic descriptions of the technology itself is an area where the community here doesn't need any help. Which is why I propose this very simple explanation for Ethereum. One that a wider audience can get behind. Very simply, Ethereum allows us to build the web we wanted and is the web we should want. That again, Ethereum allows us to build the web we wanted and is the web we should want. So the key to increasing engagement in this topic is to communicate the, um, effectively, the importance of this thing, decentralization, because I think that's key to all of this. And of course, decentralization is nothing new. Let's stop pretending that it is. Starting in the 1970s, the internet itself was always envisioned as a decentralized collective of computers. In fact, the whole enterprise of today's modern internet started with these core principles. The core principles of sharing, openness, and decentralization. For some weird reason, too many of us have a collective cultural blind spot when it comes to our history here and seem to forget exactly why the internet existed. So, quick history lesson. The internet started as ARPANET, a defense project with the objective of connecting several supercomputers at uh, sites in the US so that if any one of them was destroyed by a nuclear explosion, then the remaining computers would continue to function. It was to be built to be decentralized. In other words, just in case any foreign enemies decide to nuke your magical pieces of paper. But when the internet got a front end and morphed into the World Wide Web in the 1990s, largely thanks to a Brit, Tim Berners-Lee, a new vision emerged, one that was met with an optimism that was captured so perfectly by John Perry Barlow in his Declaration of the Independence of Cyberspace. It begins, 
Governments of the industrial world, you weary giants of flesh and steel, I come from cyberspace, the new home of the mind. On behalf of the future, I ask you of the past to leave us alone. You are not welcome among us. You have no sovereignty where we gather. His manifesto was a response to the Telecommunication tele Reform Act. And today, with the Electronic Communication Privacy Act on the horizon, the folk in this room have a chance to put blockchain front and center of the public consciousness. In 1996, it was all about control of media channels. Today, it's about personal privacy. So if we don't seize the opportunity to have this conversation, then we expose ourselves. After all, if we fast forward from 1996 to 2007, the traditional institutions won. Today, the percentage of communications that run through centralized corporations is staggering. Barlow's vision called for the sovereignty of netizens, citizens of the web, who self-govern in a space where the old institutions have no sway. Perhaps we need a return to these ideals. We have collectively failed to realize the transcendent possibilities of cyberspace and instead allowed for capital to redefine its priorities and simultaneously our own. The result? Web 2.0. Humanity's greatest social experiment becomes a way to share cat photos with each other. You see, we're at a point at which we're letting convenience win over privacy. None of us ever expected that. I suppose it just goes to show how we underestimated how lazy humans are when it comes to reading the terms and conditions of the web services that we use. Blockchain is the alternative, the way to return privacy and agency to the individual. But all I've heard so far is an attempt to describe blockchain as a continuation of the old system. We need to learn as a community how to effectively communicate what blockchain might reveal. The very possibility that our species might actually be collaborative rather than competitive. So let's return to what I find so troubling. The fact that the language associated with blockchain harks to continuation rather than transformation. Conformity rather than resistance. I mean, you call this stuff internet governance, for fuck's sake. No two words are a bigger turnoff to the general public than internet and government. And you talk about laws, and you talk about contracts, and you talk about ledgers as if you're some old washed-up Harvard law professor, rather than the sort of badass motherfuckers who are building the future of Web 3.0. Thank you. All right, we got there. We got there. And it's a problem. And it's a problem. I mean, just look at the neogelism dApps. Can we talk about dApps for a second? We need to talk about dApps for a second. Don't worry, I get it, decentralized app. How does it go? How do user interface, smart contract, servers back end for decentralized application or dApps? But I mean, of course, the general consensus doesn't follow. Am I the only person who thinks dApp is a really dumb word? <laughs> Why borrow language from Web 2.0, in this case, app, and then bastardize it in an attempt to try and explain something entirely new. I think I know where part of the problem lies, though. You want this whole thing to sound as quick, easy, and convenient as Web 2.0. You want the, the system to look like the reality that makes up our everyday experience of interconnectivity. But if you guys really want to build Web 3.0, then you need to develop a new language that doesn't hide the differences, but instead aims to expose the difference in how this technology functions and operates. You should embrace, encourage, and most of all, engineer difference. Embrace, encourage, and engineer Ethereum. We all know this isn't about building the next internet, but instead is a collective realization that the foundations on which today's internet is built are unstable. The ultimate task here is to assess how we might relay the foundations. And if Web 2.0 became the construction project that John Perry Barlow wanted to resist, then Web 3.0 inevitably begins with a demolition. Surely, if you want to re... If you 
Sorry, you don't want to just reinvent, but you want to invent a entirely new paradigm. And if you truly want to innovate, then you should stay away from language that is based on already broken systems. Again, when you call these things the internet government, I get it. You're trying to force normalization of the blockchain. What you forget that this thing, what you forget is that when this thing wins out, which it inevitably will, because I believe in the talent that I see in this room, and uh, then. Well, I believe in the time I see in this room. And when it does win out, we won't be using words like Ethereum, blockchain, or crypto. We would just call it the internet. <laughs> Don't believe me? Look at the history of the cyber prefix. Cyber, a five-letter word prefix de derived from the word cybernetics and added to a number of words in the mid-90s to explain their function when related to new information technologies. Cyberculture. Cyber space, cyber law, cyber bullying, cyber crime, cyber warfare, cyber terrorism, cyber sex. Today, we don't talk about cyber culture or cyber law. It's just culture, and it's just law. The use of the cyber prefix only remains when we're talking about something that is deviant, different, alien, intimidating. Cyber crime, cyber warfare, cyber terrorism, for example. One of the neodulisms that emerged uh, from this time was a subcultural genre of cyberpunk. Cyberpunk was high-tech, low-life, anti-authoritarian, brand-adverse, and yet tech-literate. A way to express the web in literature, prose, and most importantly, culture. And it is cyberpunk that made me realize that something is strikingly missing from this whole blockchain enterprise. And that's an aesthetics. There is no aesthetics for an Ethereum-based future. For things to become culturally relevant, they need to develop an aesthetic language. Cyberspace had cyberpunk, so it follows that Ethereum needs to develop an etherpunk. Maybe. <laughs> The future is already here, it's just not evenly decentralized, to, turn, uh, to borrow a turn of phrase. Etherpunk is something that could be co-owned by the public and by the engineers. A narrative and form of storytelling that underlines the reasons this is the future we would want to build. Now to remind you, Ethereum allows us to build the web we wanted and is the web we should want. To communicate this whole enterprise to the public, we don't need better metaphors explained in 15 minutes. Instead, we need a conscious raising moment that makes us collectively aware of blockchain being a preferred future. A moment that makes blockchain the sexiest motherfucking thing you could talk about at a dinner party. And to do that, we need to consider the unimagined possibilities of the Ethereum platform. And where I think they are, where I think we need the most push for decentralization is in neuro and bio data. We are at a crossroads. The public is increasingly aware that they are the product. They are becoming more and more cognizant to the facts that their thoughts and feelings that they share through the interactions they perform on their little shiny glowing rectangles have value. Human minds have been mined for what is valuable to market researchers and advertisers. You are the reason for multi-million dollar IPOs. So what next? Well, human bodies will be mined for a much richer form of data. Neurosignals and genetic information. This is a form of primary data and has the ability to reveal so much more about the intricacies of what makes us human. As such, we should be less willing to hand it over to the stacks or have it stored on the cloud. The public should be allowed to choose where this data ends up, how it is sold, and whether it can be donated to research initiatives. Here is a real opportunity for the blockchain to serve as the medium through which data is transacted. What more, it will allow you to show the worth of blockchain to individuals who never thought about the importance of decentralization in the past. After all, we all have bodies and we all have brains. At least most of us do. To paraphrase John Perry Barlow again, 
Ethereum should be an act of nature and grow itself through collective action. Or very simply, Ethereum allows us to build the web we wanted and is the web we should want. Whatever the future looks like for blockchain, this is Ethereal Summit. So it goes without saying that our collective action needs to be out of this world. So on that note, I'm just going to say, uh, is Karl and Mark here? So we got Karl and Mark at the back. I've been told to say that uh, they are both developers at Consensus. And if you actually want to understand the technology and not the... Uh, the the, the mission statement there, then uh, Carl has been recently doing prestigious work as a researcher with the Ethereum Foundation, and uh, Mark has been working on a paper to describe an economically incentivized game for establishing consensus, uh, whether the content of the domain name is high quality or not, and they'll be hanging out to actually answer people's questions about the technology itself, something that I deliberately failed to do. And look, whatever happens, we're talking about the future. So let me end with a with a warning. The, uh, the future is always virtual. And some things that may seem imminent or inevitable never actually happen. Fortunately, our ability to survive the future is not predicated on our capacity for prediction. Although, and on those much more rare occasions, something remarkable does come of staring the future deep in the eyes and challenging everything that it seems to promise. I hope that's exactly what you'll do today at Ethereum Summit. Thank you for your time.